Is this frequency open? Is this frequency open? CQ, 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 WX0, MIK, Whiskey X-Ray 0, Mike India Kilo. CQ, 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 WX0, MIK. Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Michael's Podcast. This is the Dog Days of Podcasting edition for August uh, 28th, 2019. I am your host, Mike Wills, otherwise known as WX0MIK. Um, that is my ham radio call sign. And this year, this season, we are talking about amateur radio and basically kind of going through the technician manual and uh, how to get your your own license. With impending hurricane into Florida, that is, becomes a prime example of why amateur radio is so important. Because it, and, you know, that hasn't happened yet, but cell phone towers can go down. Internet and cable infrastructure, all that stuff that makes the internet work, could also go down. What is left to communicate? And I don't know exactly how public safety stuff works. I assume it does point uh, simplex, point to point. But I have also have a feeling they require their antenna. I don't know. Uh, that's one place I don't know the information for. But there again, amateur radio, we don't need all that stuff. We don't need no stinking towers. It helps, but we don't need them. So that is where we come in. And we've talked about in the last several times. Unfortunately, the hurricane net is hard to listen to tonight. So otherwise, I would play just a brief bit about that. So instead, we are going to talk about um, radio frequencies. And on, yeah, radio frequency, RF, in your station and interference. Well, actually, RFI technically, but uh, so 9.2 is matching RF in your station. This is less important to the technician than it is for people, for general and above, who are communicating on HF. But it's also important to at least have a basic understanding. And if you've ever worked with your, um, not your radio equipment, your audio equipment, and all of a sudden you, like, where you had a ground loop, uh or a ground loop issue or something. This kind of covers it, at least in the in a little bit at least. Um, not maybe not necessarily this section, but this whole chapter. So your amateur station is close to the transmitting antenna. As a result, the station wiring, feed lines, power connections, and other cables all pick up RF from your transmitted signal. The feed lines and cables are in turn connected to your equipment enclosures and connections between them. The resulting is called common mode because it flows on all wires and enclosures. It, it is not practical to ground this RF current the same way as for power and lightning protection. Instead of trying to create zero volts point, the best approach is for amateurs to bond all the equipment together. And this keeps all of your equipment at the same voltage. So the RF current does not flow between the different pieces. So really what they're saying here is you get, um, some people use copper pipe. I've also heard some other people say that you don't use that. Some people use copper plumbing strip. Other people say don't use that. I, it seems like it's just as much confusion as anything else in, in amateur radio. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is you're li linking everything together without preventing, without creating a loop so that all the RF that is extra for just floating around can be piped out to the ground. Um, it also says in this section that uh, low power UHF, VHF, VHF stations usually have few RF problems, um, but it still kind of talks about it. 
Um, it's far more likely for RF current flowing in sensitive audio cables and data cables to interfere with your station's normal function. At, just as your, your strong transmitter signal might be picked up and detected by your by your neighbor's telephone or audio system, RF feedback via microphone cable can cause distorted trans or transmit audio. I pretty much read that entire section. So what they recommend is bond all metal equipment enclosures to a common RF ground bus, such as piece of copper pipe, heavy wire, sheet of flashing, etc. Use short wide conductors as copper flashing or strap or heavy solid wire. Thick solid strap is best because it presents the lowest impedance to RF. So very wide straps, usually call them tinned. That's typically why I see a lot of people use. Keep all connections, straps, and wires as short and direct as possible. And connect the ground bus to your AC safety ground and any earth connections to lighting for lightning protection. Um, this becomes a whole thing. And the more I dig into it, I mean, there's literally, and it's on my desk here somewhere, there's literally a book on RF bond, or RF grounding or grounding. <laughs> it, it becomes a never ending like, okay, you got to do this. You got to do this. Well, how do you ground a laptop? Well, there's no ground screw to a laptop. How do you ground a laptop? How do you ground every single little piece of equipment to make sure it all is together? That becomes difficult real fast. So, yeah, that um, is a challenge. On top of that, you should be gr- uh, linking your AC ground, the, the, the ground that you should have in your electrical panel, should also be bonded to this entire system, is how they're describing it. In practicality, I'm not sure how far you have to go. This is things I am starting to look at, and I'm getting more confused every time I look at it. So, more reading. (laughs) I am more learning. So, the next uh, one we're going to talk about right away is RF interference, or RFI. Um, So, RFI can occur in, let's see here, more and more electronic devices and electrical appliances are put in use Interference between them and hand radio, or RFI, can occur in either direction. So this section is really talking about how to kind of prevent this interference. Not in our radios, mostly, but more so in these appliances that have the issue. So, I mean, imagine you have a hand radio operator sitting right next, right next door to you, or yourself... And every time you transmit, your TV goes crazy. Uh, maybe it's an t- antenna TV, maybe something else, whatever. But um, I have had this with my radio, my truck, uh, where I had my um, my radio transmitter for my uh, my my uh, phone was keyed to a certain frequency, and every time I hit the button, it just went nuts. So I had I ended up just changing the station, but there's other ways to handle that. And this section really talks about that. So first thing they talk about is using filters. Uh, filters are important part of a radio, and they're as important as in preventing and eliminating RFI as well. And typically you can use things like a ferrite bead or other things like that. Um, you can also do um, very strong link signals can also kind of just overwhelm a radio's uh, a receiver's ability to reject them, and so sometimes you need to do some um, other tricks in order to make that happen. I'll just put that. Um, due to minor imperfections, every transmitter's RF output signal contains weak harmonics of the desired output signal. Um, then you kind of talk about that. And then there's other like spurious emissions is what they call them. So it can cause interference to nearby equipment just because you're transmitting. And this is usually transmitting. This is not um, 
come on brain. This is not receiving. So in some cases, it could be just a loose connection. It could be um, the equipment is not, quote, properly um, restricting the frequencies as to it bringing in. Things like that. Um, regardless of the source of this uh, RFI, you can reduce or eliminate much interference by making sure your own cell station follows good amateur practices for grounding and filtering. So start to make sure it's in good working order, um, appropriate ground filtering, good good quality connections. Um, use shielded wire and shielded cables to prevent coupling with unwanted signals. Eliminate interference to your own home appliances and televisions first. Demonstrating that you aren't interfering with your own devices is a good start. Um, eliminate sources of interference uh, in your own home, such as worn-out motors, poorly filtered power supplies, and so on. Um, and then they start talking about how to handle your neighbors. This one gets a little weird. Um, cause they, they say some, at some point your neighbor might have some, it, it could go both ways. You could be interfering something with your neighbor or your neighbor could be causing interference to you. This is where you better be practicing your diplomacy and better start rolling charisma rolls. Well, D and D reference there. Uh, start to making sure it's really your transmission that's causing a problem. Uh, you know, cause they can say, that damn antenna on your roof, it's causing problems all the time, and you're not even home. Then it's not you. <laughs> um, offer to help demonstrate the nature of the interference, detection, overload, harmonics, knowing the cause leads to solutions. In uh, other occasions, maybe receiving harmful interference. Uh, make sure that your station is in good practice and good setup. Um, offer to help determine the source of interference. So that's when you gotta kind of talk to your neighbor. Um, you may have to play, like, explain that FCC rules prohibit them from using the device that causes interference. That seems a little extreme, but also true. So, you know, you really start getting into these weird gray areas when you start talking about RFI and so on. Um, the other thing that this doesn't mention, but that the um, general mentions is another source of RFI is a bad transformer. Now imagine explaining to your power company that, hey, my, um, I'm pretty sure my uh, transformer is causing, uh, has an issue that's sparking, that usually it's sparking, that's the issue. And, you know, I'm, you know, you just try to imagine this conversation. They're like, well, how the hell do you know that? But on the other hand, it also says, you know, that sparking is wasted electricity. So they would probably ultimately appreciate it if that is the case. But tracking that down and your source of RFI can become a hunt and peck a little bit on that. So, um, the last part is part 15 rules. What is part fi a part 15 device? Part 15 is FCC's of the FCC rules governs the responsibilities of owners of unlicensed devices that use low power RF communications or radiate low power signals on frequencies used by licensed services, such as amateur radio. Examples include cordless phones, wireless data trans transceivers, power lines, electric fences, and computers. These are called Part 15 devices. Uh, reducing Part 15 to its basic principles are an unlicensed device permitted under Part 15 or an unintentional radiator may not cause interference to a, a licensed communication station such as amateur radio station. Its owner must prevent it from causing such interference or stop operating it. Imagine, start talking with your neighbors about this. That becomes a thing. Um, an unlicensed device permitted under Part 15 must accept interference caused by a properly operating licensed communication station. So, you know, really you can take this, and this works exactly the same as at your um, AM radio stations, your FM radio stations, 
any other station, this falls under that. So it's not just you as an amateur radio operator that is dealing with this. This is every radio station, every, um, uh, come on, brain, every like commercial radio system and so on. Uh, what this means is as long as your station is a good op- good operating uh, and operating properly under FCC's rules, then your operation protected against RF- against interference and by complaints of interference to unlicensed equipment. So kind of like not your problem <laughs> if you're following the rules properly. So, um, yeah, that is... Uh, um, That is uh, nice to know that as long as you're doing everything right, the FCC has your back. You know, the neighbor can go start complaining that, well, that guy, my neighbor, he's a complete jerk. He doesn't, he's broadcasting all these things and I don't know what he's doing, but he's screwing up my technology and blah, blah, blah. And so the FCC then comes and investigates and say, oh, yeah, you've got a properly working station. Everything is kosher. Your license is up to date. You're good. Dude, go take a hike. you got to replace your equipment or figure out how to fix it yourself or whatever. <laughs> so you kind of get a certain amount of power, but with that, you have to know this stuff. And that's where bonding and grounding book comes in handy and all these other books that you can get from the ARRL and uh, pretty soon you have an entire library of books you know and there's YouTube videos there's this and that and I've watched a bunch of those so it's not just the test that you have you have lots of different resources (sighs) well I think that we're going to cut it off there for today uh, tomorrow we talk about RF exposure, and that also talks about your neighbors a little bit. And then we really have one section left after that, and that is mechanical safety. And um, then we are to the end, unless you want to go through the glossary, but I don't think we need to do that. The glossary and test is all that's left in the book. So... We got what three days left of uh, the uh, three yeah three days left of the um, challenge and uh, two chapters. So that gives us one to wrap everything up into a nice neat package, maybe. <laughs> huh. So I mean, I'm going to cut it off here, and then uh, we can uh, talk tomorrow. So until then, this is WX Zero M I K. And uh, I think the neighbor's complaining, but your frequency is clear. The frequency is clear. WX0MIK73.